day, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for another edition of Grilling the Birds, brought to you by Inside the Birds. That man, dapper individual over there is Trey Thomas. I'm Derek Gunn. Trey, good to see you again. I wish it was under better circumstances, but always good to talk football with you. Yeah, man, you know, we, we're just pushing through this season, man. You know, another one down, another one in the books, and we just have to keep grinding through it. Well, outside of the Rams game, here's another situation where the Eagles are right there. They have a chance to possibly pull this game out, and yet they do things to self-destruct. So here we stand at 1-3-1. One, and one. Give me your general consensus of what we're continuing to see from this team. I think one of the things you continue to see with, from this team is just, you know, the undisciplined plays, a lot of the mistakes, all of the penalties. I mean, this was another game where I think you had double-digit penalties. Eight of them were on the defensive side of the ball. So, you know, you just continue to see the same mistakes over and over again. Now, one of the things that you can take away from it is that guys are starting to play with a little bit more energy. It's starting to, they're starting mm -hmm. to come around a little bit. But, you know, you keep shooting yourself in the foot with all the penalties and just mistakes that, that should be talked about during the week throughout practice. Or even that guys should know better but, you know, the mistakes continue to happen. Now, this Eagles offense, they put up 29 points uh, against the Steelers defense uh, that's ranked third overall that was giving up less than 20 points a game before uh, they played the Eagles. So we, we're starting to see some improvement in the offense. It didn't go as smooth as we want to see it, but it's getting better each week, it appears to me. Yeah, it's definitely getting better. I think Carson has come around a little bit more, especially in this game here, man. You saw Carson make some big time throws in this game. Yeah. You know, and, and this is this is what we've been, what everybody has been kind of anticipating and expecting from Carson. So for him to come out of this game, and, and you know, you, I know it wasn't a win, but you saw him make some throws, and and that's what you've been wanting to see: some nice anticipation throws. Sometimes where he's taking shots down the field, where before it just seems like Carson would have been a little bit more gun shy and tried to play it safe. But he, instead, he just put it out there for his receivers to go out there and make some plays. Now, one of the reasons why the offense is getting better is, a, is an unknown expected contributor. Uh, this young man, Travis Fulgham, is growing up right before our very eyes, man, against a, a good Steelers pa uh, pass defense team. Ten catches, a buck fifty-two, one touchdown. Man, he used and abused uh, the uh, Steelers secondary in this game. Yeah, I mean, he just came to play. I mean, you know what? I, I am really enjoying watching Travis Fuller because there are times that he's a receiver that's going to go up and get the ball. He's winning some of those 50-50 balls. I mean, you know, he's working himself open. He puts himself in good situations so that if they are playing zone, he sits right down in the zone makes a big target for Carson to, get, to throw the ball. Because there were times where there was pressure and Carson found him and got rid of the ball. So, you know, a Travis Fulton just really emerged and really showing himself to be someone that belongs on this stage. Now, of course, the previous game, he makes a game-winning touchdown catch. This time, obviously, Carson has a lot of confidence and, and comfortability with this young man. Are you surprised? Uh, that this guy Fulgham has, has become his go-to target more so than J.J. Arthega Whiteside, more so than Greg Ward, more so than John Hightower. Well, I'm not surprised about the J.J. going to him before over J.J. Arthega Whiteside. I mean, you know, it's... You know. Give J.J. a chance, man. Come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you gave him a chance. You gave him a chance and you saw what he did. You know, but we'll get to that. But, you know, we'll get to that part. But, but I, you know, for whatever reason, like I said before, when we talked about this last week, it seems that Carson, whenever he gets guys that are that are not your, 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 your seasoned vets or the guys that have been around the league for a long time, you know, he plays a lot better. You know, it just seems like, you know, he, he has a better chemistry with guys that, that are hungry because I think that it, it kind of matches – his personality as well. So it's kind of the same type of mindset out there on the field instead of guys that's going to have bad body language if they don't get the ball the right way or whatever the situation is. These young guys are hungry and ready to make plays. And for whatever reason, Carson just gels better with them. 
one guy we've, we've been expecting to make plays for quite some time, and it just hasn't happened for this offense yet, uh, Zach Ertz. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the last last two games, he has five catches for 15 yards. On the season, he's averaging four catches, 29 yards a game. I mean, what's going on here? We're, you know, I know Doug Peterson said a, a couple of times Carson overthrew him, but, I mean, it's like he's not even looking at Zach Ertz in certain situations now. Yeah, because I, I, I think Carson is spreading the ball around a lot more. He doesn't want it to be where it's all focused on one player. So, you know, he's allowing some of these younger guys to eat. And I think this car, this contract situation also is start weighing on Ertz a little bit because, you know, it just doesn't look the same when he's out there on the field. Some of his body language at times just doesn't have that same zest and energy that you used to see from him before. So it just looks like sometimes he's just kind of just out there, you know, and um, I think that, number one, the contract is weighing down on him. And then when you start seeing the balls go to other guys instead of it going to you, I think that kind of weighs on it as well. So, you know, to come out of this game where you only had six targets, one catch, you know, that, that can't feel too good to, to uh, compared to someone that was averaging around eight or nine targets per game before. You know, okay, people are trying to say, well, you know, maybe Zach Ertz is – is being double team more. Okay, he's getting a few double teams, but not as much as we we were thought it was, right? No, no, no. It's not every day, you know. There were a couple times, yeah, the ball was going in a bad situation or they kind of, you know, shade the defense over to him a little bit, but there, it's not always double coverage all the time. I mean, you know, especially when you start seeing them. There were a couple balls that maybe they were overthrown, but it wasn't double coverage. It was just a little bit outside. It wasn't, a, it wasn't where Ertz could pull it in, but, you know, it's now that you have Fogum, because going into this game anyway, you knew that, all right, you know what, with Dallas out, who's going to be the next person that you try to take away? You try to take Zach out of the equation. Yep. But now with Travis Fogum emerging, then now, all right, so who's going to be the next person? You know Fogum's going to be get a lot of the attention moving forward. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're talking about Zach and his money. And Zach, what I know of Zach Ertz, he is a consummate professional. Once that season started – He's not talking about his money. He's not talking about contract. But Zach Ertz is a businessman first and foremost. Zach Ertz wants to get paid, whether it's by the Philadelphia Eagles or one of the other 31 teams, uh, potential employers out there. And if Zach Ertz lines up every game and if Zach Ertz looks at his numbers, you know it's got to start weighing on him. I mean, when you're averaging – when you consider one of the top three or four tight ends in the game and you look at the numbers and you're averaging four catches, 29 yards a game, you know that has to have some kind of effect on you when you step, step between those strikes. Oh, absolutely, especially when it's in a year where, you know, you're making a big hoopla about getting paid and getting your money, and then now you're not producing. It doesn't have – you don't have the same production. You don't have the same numbers. You don't have the same yards. All of that weighs into it, makes a nice little gumbo of feelings and emotions right now to where, you know, it's like, all right, well, what am I doing? First of all, I'm going to protect myself to make sure I make it out of this season without having to have any surgeries at the end end of the season. Just in case if I have to walk, I'm able to walk and go to another team without having to say, all right, well, I have to have surgery or whatever. So you're going to protect yourself a little bit, especially when you have a season that's going this way. You mess around and have a couple more losses then you're going to really start seeing what guys are playing for on this team. Now, you talk about Zach Ertz like any other player trying to protect himself for the long-range future. Does that mean maybe Zach Ertz mentally, and I'm not trying to start anything, but does that mean taking a playoff here and there, trying to save the body, trying to save the shoulder, the knees, the ankles a little bit? No, I'm not saying that he's trying to – well, I think he is trying to protect himself where, you know what, some of those balls across the middle – I'm not yep. going to extend myself all the way out. I'm not going to open all my rib cage up for you. you made, a, made a business decision. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm just getting over the ruptured spleen. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you yep. know, I, I, you got to protect yourself right now. You want to make it through the season. We want to make sure that when, when things going, but I don't think Zach is going to take any plays off. But I do right. think you're going to kind of like, all right, you know what? Let's, yeah, I don't want to go for that one right there. That one right there is a little too dangerous for me. Uh, Steelers went into this game, one of the better run defenses in the National Football League early in the game. Miles Sanders hits one, a home run, 74 yards, takes it to the house. After that, for the game, the Eagles end up with only 94 yards rushing, 20 yards the rest of the game except that one run, and they only had 16 carries total in the game. Should they have committed to the run a little bit more? I mean, I think they tried, you know, but I think when you play against a 3-4 front, 
it's it's hard running against a really good three four defense. Think back to when when Chip Kelly was here when we ran a three four. Man, we led the league in, in, with rushing defense. It's hard running up against a three four defense, especially when you have a nasty nose guard. And I think that Pittsburgh did a good job of hitting the gaps. You know, taking advantage of us on some of those combination blocks, getting in there and stopping the running backs before they even really get going. I mean, if you go back and you look at that 74-yard touchdown, it was a draw, but, I mean, they ran a TE on the left side that neither uh, Jordan or Nate did a good job of picking it up. So, really, that that touchdown was all Miles Sanders until he got up into the secondary. And then you had Ward and J.J. I think a white side made some good blocks up downfield that allowed Miles Sanders to go ahead and make that big run. But other than that, they didn't do anything special when it came to blocking that run. Okay, you mentioned the term TE. For people out there who don't know, what did you mean by TE? When we're talking about a TE or ET, those are games that are happening on the defensive line. When, if it's a TE, that means that the tackle is the penetrator and the end is going to be the looper. If it's an ET, then the end is the penetrator, penetrator and then the tackle is a looper. So that's just a way that we communicate what type of game it is. If it's a TE, tackle penetrator, end looper, ET, end penetrator, tackle looper. So just a way of the, how we communicate what type of line stunt it is. See, not only are you a former player and an analyst, but you're an educator too. That's why I come to you, man. Yeah, See? You know, I wear many hats. I wear many hats. All right, let's go inside the trenches with uh, Dre Thomas and look at this offensive line play. They gave up five quarterback sacks, uh, 11 hits on Carson Wentz. Lane Johnson still bothered by the injury. We found out earlier this week that he won't need ankle surgery again, but it's something that's going to bother him all season long. So you've got offensive linemen in and out because Lane kept saying, I want to go back in, I want to go back in. But how much did that affect the continuity up front in protecting the franchise quarterback? I think a lot of a lot goes into that because you don't have any cohesion. I mean, you know, when you have a guy that's in and out of the huddle, you know, he's in and out of the game, that has a throw off timing, that has a throw off, all right, who am I dealing with, uh, communication, all of that, you know, because you've gone throughout the week expecting to be next to someone, and then now you have someone totally different in there. I mean, you know, yep. that that all of that plays into it. But now, what's, let's go back to this, um, to Lane Johnson injury because I have a clip here that I want to show you. Right here, they had a defensive tackle and a defensive end here, and they ran a game on this one. Now, for whatever reason, Lane decided to jump the defensive end. Well, the three technique comes out. He clips Lane's ankle. So you can see it clearly in this tape mm -hmm. that the defensive end clips Lane's ankle, and then now after that, the next play, you can see Lane just hobbling so you can kind of tell that that right there was a particular play that really took Lane out of this game. Now, based off of what I would much rather have seen him do, I would have much rather seen him vertical set against that wide three technique instead of jumping the defensive end. But you know what? He made his decision. Now he ended up with a, his ankle even worse off. And then there you go. Now he's hobbling around and now he's in and out of the game. Now, from what I'm told as of right now, they're not going to put Lane on IR, which would be three weeks, but You've dealt with this kind of ankle injury. We discussed this earlier in the season, why he waited so long to have this surgery. But at this point, because it is bothering him and affecting his overall play, should they maybe sit him for one or two games? I know it's a big detriment because your line is already decimated. But should they sit him for one or two games and get continuous treatment on that ankle to try to help strengthen that thing for the long run? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, you know, um, if, if you want him to finish up the season – Absolutely. But I knew going into this season and, you know, for whatever reason, I didn't know about Lane's ankle injury or whatever it is. But I knew going into this season that when Brandon Brooks wasn't going to be out there on that field, that yep. Lane Johnson wasn't going to be out there on that field much either. But just because he depends on Brandon Brooks way a lot. They lean on each other. They are peas and carrots, you know, whatever, you know, so I knew that once Brandon Brooks wasn't going to be out there on that field, that Lane Johnson was not going to be he was not going to be able to play the entire season. Now, now he, you get into the ankle injury or whatever, and now here we are. You know he's missing plays. He's going to be missing the game, and of course, you know you have to make a decision to be able to have him be able to make it through the season for the long haul and not injure him any more than what he already is. 
So you're saying it's like Batman missing his Robin, Green Hornet exactly. missing his Kato, Captain missing the Tennille, Peaches yes. missing, missing her. I'm just throwing it out there, bro. I'm just yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm, the I'm, Captain I'm, missing Gilligan. I mean, you know, all of that. <laughs> now you, you want you want to talk about that young man again, Jordan Malato. Uh, yes. Jordan Malato, he gave him one sack. Um, which is always, you know, it's it's a shame offensive linemen are judged by how many sacks they give up. He only gave one, but for the most part, as you you're about to point out, he held his own against a fierce pass rush. Yeah, I mean Jordan, man, you know, I'm constantly amazed by how much better he keeps getting every game. I mean, to this week, last week you saw him out there catching a lot. You know, his hands were down low, and he was catching a lot of the defensive end. But this week, you started seeing him taking really nice sets shooting his hands, staying in good posture. Uh, you know, now there are a couple times when I see where, all right, you know what, if you're going to set at a 45, and this is just for anybody that's going to learn to play tackle. If you yep. set at a 45, if you don't make contact on your second step, your outside foot drops, okay? And one of, there's a one particular play that was there, there was a hurry where he created pressure because he took uh, two steps at a four, two kicks at a 45, he drops mm -hmm. his outside foot, then now Dupree beats him inside, which created a pressure. Carson Wentz was able to duck underneath the pressure and then scramble around and find Fogum, but he took a nice little hit at the end. But that's something that Jordan Maialata is going to have to continue to work on is being a little bit more consistent with his set and how, how he's going to set those defensive ends. Now, that's not to say that you can't set at a 45, but you have to make sure when you do set at a 45, you have to make contact on that second kick. Now, on the sack, hey, man, you know, everybody, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, you know, I wish I could sit up there and say, like, oh, that never happened to me. Every offensive lineman, every offensive tackle has gotten beat off the snap count. And that's yeah. exactly what Dupree, he timed up the cadence perfectly, beat Jordan Maialata off the snap count. And you can tell that Jordan Maialata, once, once it happened, and every tackle feels this way when it happens, you like old oh, sugar, honey, iced tea, I'm in trouble. You know what I'm saying? I need to, oh, let me try to do whatever I can do to try to take the hit off the quarterback. Oh, no, it's too late. He's already on him. Please don't fumble the ball because I just got toasted right here on this one, and, I, and there's nothing I can do for you. And, and I mean, Dupree got him. I mean, you know, and I knew it was coming at some point because Dupree is such a fast end. But I thought across the board, though, throughout that game, Jordan yeah. did a heck of a job throughout that game. Sugar, honey, iced tea. Uh, we know what the initial stands for. Where'd you, where'd you come up with this stuff? Hey, man, you know, <laughs> you know what? You know where I got that from? Watching oh, yeah. Madagascar, the cartoon. Come on, man. Seriously. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was in Madagascar, the cartoon. So, yeah, man, you know, sugar, honey, iced tea. Oh, That's sugar, honey, good. iced tea. I'm in trouble. I'm going to I'm gonna have to use that one when I get a little <laughs> upset. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, quarterback, Carson Wentz, two more interceptions, nine on the season against six touchdown passes. Um, he's played better two consecutive weeks now. He's played better, but he's still missing some throws that he has made in the past. He's missing wide-open receivers that he's hit in the past. What's going on up here with this young man, uh, uh, Trey? I think that, you know, yeah, he made some misses, but, I mean, I guess overall, though, man, when you look at this game, yeah, you had two interceptions, but this was one of the better games that he's played. Yeah, I mean, yes. you know, for him to go out there and make some of these throws, there were throws that Carson made where we were like, where, whoa, where did this come from? I mean, the one pass where you had Fogum across the middle and you had three defenders converging on him, Carson drops it right where it needs to be. Fogum went up, made a big catch. I mean, you know, there are passes in this game that you can go back and watch and you're like blown away. That, okay, all right, Carson, this is the Carson that we've been expecting and that we've been waiting on. I know you look at the two interceptions and you're like, oh, oh it's, it, if you look at the box score, you'll be like, oh, he threw two more interceptions. But yeah. on, the one, on the one interception, you know, the defensive guy, he, he knocked Ertz off, the, off his route. Yeah. Where, Car where Carson threw the ball, if Ertz wasn't knocked off his route, it would have been in a perfect position, a perfect – location for Ertz, it was low, where Ertz would have been able to make the catch and protect himself. But now I go back and I look at that play and I feel like, all right, you know what, Carson, maybe instead of going for Ertz on that play, which would have been a good throw, why not hit Miles Sanders on the on the same side there? Because 
the guy that the, the defender that knocked Ertz off of his route was supposed to be uh, defending Miles Sanders in the flats. So, you know, that right there, you have that, you know. But, I mean, and then you go back and you say, okay, we're getting ready to go into halftime. Let me let me just get my mind right for this one. Uh-oh. We're getting ready to go into halftime. <laughs> All right. We only have 12 seconds left on the clock. Fogum has been balling for you so far. And you say, you know what? Instead of waiting to see what Fogum gives me on the left side, now nah, I'm going to see what I can get with J.J. Ortega White side on the right side. <laughs> J.J. Ortega White side makes a beautiful catch. I mean, beautiful catch with the corner and safety coming over the top. J.J. makes the catch. Boom, right there. But J.J. wants to celebrate that, hey, I caught the ball. It's a first down. <laughs> JJ, get the ball to the referee. But JJ is so excited that he caught the ball in his mind. He's like, oh my God, I caught the ball. I caught the ball. Look, Kelsey, I caught the ball. Look, I have the ball. Give it to the referee. He needs to spot it. But instead, he gives the ball to Kelsey. And Kelsey's standing there with the ball like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> JJ is like, snap it again because I can catch. And then there you go. We go into halftime. I mean, you know, I'm just like, wow, what is going on with this team? Not only did you not have – you had JJ, but then you had Hightower where he made a catch on the left side, didn't get out of bounds, which could have saved, could save some time on the clock. And then you have JJ up there the white side, catch the ball, and is so damn excited that he caught the ball. He forgot where he was and gave the ball to Kelsey. And Kelsey is sitting up there like, what do you want me to do? I can't do anything with this. I have to give it to the referee. You know what? We're out of time. Let's go in the halftime and go get some more slices because that's it. There's nothing else that can be done here. Look at man. Leave J.J. alone, man. This young man has less than 15 catches in the season plus. He's a national footballer. He's happy, man. Let that young man celebrate the few catches that he does make. I know, but man, come on, man. You you, you know, you had a chance to get some points on the board. Now I think Carson <laughs> should have I think Carson should have been a little bit more patient and he could have found Fogel. Fogel was coming free on the left side that would have been wide open for a touchdown. But you know what? He wanted to get JJ Ortega White side involved in the game plan. And you know what? He, he, he made the catch. You gotta give it up to him. He, he he got the catch. But <laughs> We go into halftime because he doesn't know what to do with the ball. It's almost <laughs> like with uh, Talladega Nights where he's like, I don't know what to do with my hands. What I, I, what do I do with my hands? And he didn't know what to do with the ball. Okay, now, so when you were playing, you were playing with a veteran-laden team. If, if a young receiver had made that kind of mistake on the team you played for under Andy Reid, would you guys have said anything to that player at halftime? We, we had Deshaun Jackson when we played against Dallas. Where he uh -huh. where he let the ball go right before he got into the end zone. Yeah. And I and I and I told D Jack, I was like, hey DJ, look, dog, hey man, listen. I appreciate the celebration. Celebration was awesome. But please make sure you get in the end zone, man. Cause the big dog, you know what I'm saying? Like when I got to run all this way down here down the field, man, I need to make know that you in the end zone. You know what I'm saying? Like I, you know, the big the big dog be tired when I got to run 50 yards to get down here. To get ready for this, for whatever we got to get ready to go do. I need you to make sure that you break the plane of the end zone, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so we had no problem. We had absolutely no problem talking to the young cats, man, when they make a mistake like that. Did was there a, was there a guy when you were young making mistakes? Was there a veteran who was constantly riding you and 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 and, and getting this out of your head week in and week out or Practice I, in and practice out. I had Richard Cooper, who is the master instigator. Okay. Ian Beckles, who were master instigators. Barrett Brooks, master instigators. No, Barrett Brooks. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I mean, you know, because what you got, Steve Everett, master instigators, man. You know, so they had no problem put saying something to you if you made yeah. a mistake. Yeah. All right. Now, here we are once again sitting back and critiquing Doug Peterson's decision-making. Late in the game, mm -hmm. Steelers uh, up by two points. Eagles have the ball, fourth and five at the Steelers, 39, under four minutes to play. 
we always give uh, Doug credit and applaud him in most cases, cases for being aggressive. He decides to try a 57-yard field goal, which, by the way, is well within Jake Elliott's range. But in a situation like that, why not try to pick up that five yards on the first down and move it a little bit closer to go ahead, uh, you know, to get that go-ahead field goal that would have put you up by one point? Would you have gone for it on fourth down? Yeah, I would have gone ahead. I mean, let's go ahead. I mean, what what else do we have to lose? I mean, let's go ahead and try to go after it right here. I mean, you know what? It just seems like this year, you know, Big Balls Doug is not, just not the same, you know. It's, wait, wait, wait. What would you just call him? I mean, but that's what – I mean, what the, it, was that not the name? Am I like – you're saying something that's so foreign? I mean, everybody would call him Big Balls Doug. Big Balls Doug. He walking around with a wheelbarrow to carry his balls around. I mean, you know what I'm saying? And then this is a family show, man. You can't say that. This is a family show. I mean, show. it must be cold outside. It must be cold outside. <laughs> it, I mean, it just seems like there's been a little shrinkage. It's just not the same. You know what I'm saying? When it comes down, there were some very creative wrinkles within the in, in, within some of the offense. You saw some different things. You saw Jalen Hurts throw a pass. You know, yep. they came out there in this weird formation where Kelsey and Wentz are off to the right somewhere, and you got Hurts. Uh, I mean, uh, you got Hurts right underneath. Um, uh, Nate Her- Her- Herbig, uh, that's going to snap the ball. That was a nice, different formation. But when mm-hmm. it comes to making a play call where it's like, all right, fourth and five, let me get see if I can put my guys in a chance to, like, really make something happen. Because right. now if you make that field goal, you're only up by one. And now, right. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, he made, he made a decision to, to go ahead. And, you know, it was a little cold outside. It was a little shrinkage. All right, well, you know what? Hey, I'm, man, go ahead. You can't, I'm just you saying. Can't say that. That one, you know, George Costanza said that, you know, when it's cold, there's shrinkage. Well, I just got back from swimming in the pool, <laughs> and the water was cold. Uh, <laughs> you mean shrinkage? Yes. <laughs> Significant shrinkage. So you, you feel you were shortchanged? Yes. So, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. The, the only reason I bring it up is because you go back to the Cincinnati game when people were screaming for Doug to go for them fourth and 12, mm-hmm. and he decides to punt, play the save, and, of course, it cost him you know, a tie instead of a possible win. Doug came out the next day and said, you know, after looking at the tape, you know, sure I should have go, gone for it yeah. on, on, on fourth down. So, I mean, this was a shorter distance against a much better defense, but the possibility was there. We've seen Doug – do some incredible things in fourth down situations against really good defenses. That's why I'm just saying I was shocked that Doug decided to, to, to kick the field goal instead of maybe picking it up and shortening the distance Elliott would have had to kick. In all probability, the Eagles would have been taking the lead 32-31. Yeah, I think that that played the 235 where you knew everybody and their mama knew that Wentz was going to try to go to Fulgham on that play. They, they knew, I mean, everybody knew we going to Fogum. You going to Fogum on this play. And sure enough, he goes to Fogum, and now you're looking at a four or five. So I don't know if it's chilly right there where it just got a little ch- chilly right there. The temperature dropped like 40 degrees. And he Ooh. felt like, you know what, you know what, now nah, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and kick this, you know, because shrinkage just happened. And so, you know, same thing, man, same thing. All right, we're going to get past this shrinkage stuff now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. So, you're making me a little uncomfortable right now. I'm sorry. Right. My bad. So, my bad. So, I don't want to start a controversy, but I'm going to throw it out there. Doug has been inconsistent. Doug has second-guessed himself. He's openly admitted that to the general public. Should Doug think about giving up play calling? Man, you know what? I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I, I right. think that if you ever tell Doug, all right, you have to give up play calling, you may as well go ahead and fire him. I, I, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. You would have to fire Doug to get him to uh, give up that give up that responsibility. All right. Uh, before we move on to the defensive side of the football, I got to uh, pay a bill here. And mm-hmm. so, once again, week five of the football season is now in the books, and now it's time to review the tape and get ready for week number six. There is no better place to get you in on all of the action than the DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. Now, to add to the excitement for Week 6, DraftKings Sportsbook is bringing back their cannot-miss offer. If you haven't tried DraftKings Sportsbook yet, head to the App Store right now because you don't want to miss this. DraftKings Sportsbook is giving all new users 
the chance to receive a sign-up bonus of up to $1,000. Good Lord! On top of that great sign-up offer, DraftKings offers great odds boost every Sunday to help you make it rain. Now, don't worry if football isn't for you because DraftKings is giving all you basketball fans a 200% profit boost on any basketball market once you sign up. Now, DraftKings, as we all know, is safe, reliable, and secure, making it easy for you to deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. So download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app right now and use the promo code ITB when you sign up and get up to $1,000. That's a code ITB to get a sign-up bonus of up to $1,000 for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Whew. All right, now let's go over to the defensive side. Um, this is two or three games now. Here's And you and I talked about this. This is like two or three games now where quarterbacks are starting to go to, uh, uh, right at shut down Darius Slade. What are you seeing here, Shrey? I mean, you know what? They they got to if you're going to be the best, you got to go up against the best and they're not they're not shying away from him. I mean, you know, uh, I thought they they felt like they had some good receivers out there that can try to challenge him. I think Darius Slade, he is extremely competitive. I mean, you know, uh, it does not make me think any less of him. I think that he is a true shutdown corner, but I think that they went after him a little bit and he came away with two pass interferences. I did not think the first one was actually on him, but, you know, they called it. And he, he walked away with the, out of the game with two PIs, uh, you know, and there were a couple times where he, I felt like he was playing a, a – I don't know if that was a short scheme where they right. wanted Slay to play off more. But I, I, I up until then, I thought that Slay would try to get up into the receiver's face and challenge them a little bit more. But it seemed like he was playing off a lot more this yeah. game. The more yeah. than usual, which kind of gave them a little bit more of a pocket for them to just work him a little bit. Um, up front, defensively, uh, they get to Ben Roethlisberger only one time, only got two hits on him. Why mm -hmm. couldn't this uh, Jim Schwartz rotational pass rush get home more? You know what? That was one of the more disappointing things, just because going into this game, you were battling to see who was going to be number one at getting at the quarterback. Here you had number one and number two, defenses at getting at the quarterback. We came into this game with 17, 17 sacks, yep. 45 quarterback hits. Uh, Pittsburgh was coming into this game with 15 sacks, 39 quarterback hits. Well, they finished this game with five sacks, 11 quarterback hits, compared yep. to our one sack, only two quarterback hits. You know, to me, you, you go back and you look at, one, Big Ben was getting rid of the ball extremely quick. He did a good yep. job of getting rid of the ball. But to me, I always look at what determines a sack is coverage. And when you have your secondary playing off the way that we were playing and, 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 and given all of this cushion, Big Ben was getting that ball out of his hand as quick as possible. When he did feel a little pressure, he would just work the pocket and move around and find an open receiver and keep it moving. You know, and here's another game where the defense is once again susceptible to the reverses and the jet sweeps. I mean, we're starting to see this more and more now. I mean, what, what's up? Is this a lack of defense, a lack of discipline uh, on the defense's part? I think that if you, when you're looking at jet sweeps and reverses and all that, that means that you're going to have to have your defensive ends jet upfield. That means that they can't play, they can't get into that whole uh, play action where they feel like, all right, I got to go crashing down to stop the inside zone run, and then, oh, no, here comes the jet sweep, or, oh, here comes the reverse. So, to me, it just seems like for that to happen, they need to trust their linebacker play behind them because now you're saying, ooh, all right, DNs, yeah, yeah, th that position that's supposed to be back there, you, you're going to have to trust them. You know what I'm saying? Because now if you're telling your DNs, all right, I want y'all to jet up field and don't worry about crashing down, then that means that your linebackers are going to have to fill that void and just like you saying who, then, you know, <laughs> the DNs looking at it like, who? You want me to do what? Because, you know, I can't do that. I can't trust that. And so here comes the reverse jet sweep, whatever, whatever. But then you go back and you look at even when our linebacker play, they don't come downhill. They don't play downhill. And I just feel like their instincts just aren't where it needs to be to be competitive on this level. Uh, they gave up 136 yards rushing. You know the Steelers are going to try to run the ball. You surprised they gave up that many yards on the ground? 
Yeah, but you know, when you go back and you look at how many yards they did give up, a lot of those yeah. were were reverses and all of this other stuff coming from yeah. the receivers. So I mean, you know, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, say what you really feel. I mean, you know, you know uh, I don't know. I, I I don't know what to think of it. You know, I, yeah, you know. Because, <laughs> because I thought, I thought across the board, you know, a couple times they rallied to the to the run a little bit. You know, I mean, when you look at Connor, he only had 15 rushes, 44 yards. But you know, Ray Ray McLeod, I mean, you know, he had two rushes for 63 yards. Yeah. <laughs> why you know, are you laughing? Why, why I mean, you, you, know, at you, know, you know, when that's happening, you know, that right there just happened. You know, so <laughs> what what can you do? But again. The lack of instinct because, all right, on one of the reverses, and I'm going to pull up the film for this, on one of the reverses, you see Jalen Mills just take a horrible angle, you know, just a terrible <laughs> angle instead of getting in pursuit to possibly make the stop. But instead, yeah. he tries to cut the back door of the blockers like he has the speed to catch one of these guys. And it's like, no, you, where's the instinct? You know, but... It, do you blame it? Some of it, a lot of it's going to have to go on coaching. But I, I also look at the player and I'm like, all right, you know what? Where's the instinct, man? I mean, you know, you've been playing this game long enough to where you can say, you know what? I'm not going to make that tackle going this route. Maybe right. I should take a better pursuit angle to possibly put myself in position to make a tackle. So now that brings us to the moment of truth. We talked about Doug Peterson's decision to go for the field goal at a crucial point of a game instead of going for the first down on a fourth and five situation. And, of course, they don't get it. Uh, Steelers get the ball back, good field position. And lo and behold, they go down the field. And the defining play is Nate Gary lined up over this guy, Chase Claypool, already had three touchdowns on him. And you can see when the Steelers come out in their formation, you see Nikel Roby Coleman yelling, get back, get back. And, and, and you you hear Chase Claypool after the game said, you know what, I never lined up in that spot before. Uh, that's usually Eric Ebron's spot. He goes, I'm asking him, what am I supposed to do? And the defense is, hell, is, is hearing Roethlisberger and Ebron tell him what to do, where to go. The Cal Roby Coleman hears and tells Gary to get back. And, oh, my goodness, my man's standing in quicksand, and he got toasted. Yeah. Whose fault is that? Is it on 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 Gary? Is it on Jim Schwartz? Who? I mean, because Big Ben, he recognized the situation. Boom! Ball game over. Uh, you know what? Yeah, you would say you want you want to put it on Schwartz because he's the one that called the defense. They're in dime, all right. So you have one linebacker, six cornerbacks there. So they were in dime. Big Ben, you know, he's been around the game long enough that where he's going to sit up there and, and and observe what's going on. And he right. looked over there, and he saw Nate Gary standing over Claypool. <laughs> and he stepped from behind the center and walked over there to him. Hey, I want you to give him whatever move that I need you to burn. We're going to burn him. Burn him. Him. That's what we're going to get. And everybody on the defense is standing there like, hey, you know what? Hey, Gary, they about to burn you. They, You need to back up. I'm wondering why McLeod didn't see – like, hey, uh, man, you know what? Uh, I see that Nate Gary is in a bad situation. Let me kind of rotate my coverage over to give him some over-the-top help. Again, lack of instincts. I, you know, lack of instincts and lack of not being in position to make plays. I mean, here it is. Everybody is talking. You don't have a stand full of people, you know, a stadium full of people in there where you have all of this noise and everything. Everybody is talking. It's very wide open. Like, hey, we're going to beat him. Give him an in and out at 10 yards and then go all over the top, and I'm going to throw the ball to you. Don't worry about it. We're going to get him. And, and sure enough, <laughs> bam, there it is, touchdown. <laughs> and I'm wondering, where was McLeod? You didn't hear this? You know, nobody else heard There's this? No, so, no fans in the stands, so you no shouldn't be able to hear it. Yeah. I, I mean, we hear everything when you hear the TV copy. I mean, you know. You can't hear this. You don't see this. You don't see Big Ben, and none of this, none of this registered to you and made you feel like, you know what, maybe we need to adjust when Big Ben steps from behind the center 
and starts communicating with his receiver. I mean, you know, you, none of this like, hey, hey, a light bulb. You didn't have that light bulb pop up above your head and say, hey, you know what? We need to have an idea here. Let's let's come up with something. No, no, we don't know. Touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> so here we sit, looking at a one in three and one Eagles team. Luckily for them, they are in the putrid, and let me emphasize putrid, NFC East right now. They're only half game out of first place. And lo and behold, who's next? The Baltimore Ravens, who, oh, by the way, just just smashed the Cincinnati Bengals team 27-3 that the Eagles struggled with just to get a tie from. Now, the good thing is they're playing this one at Lincoln Financial Field, and they're going to allow maybe – yeah, because they're gonna allow five or six thousand fans in the stands for this game. The bad thing is they got that man Lamar Jackson coming to town, and there's a I don't know if there's other than Patrick Mahomes, I don't know if there's a more dangerous quarterback, dual threat quarterback in the NFL right now, Trey. Yeah, I don't know if it, it, of course I'm <laughs> glad that we're coming back home. We're gonna be able to get some of the fans <laughs> in the stadium. Look at your face. Your face says a lot, man. Okay. I'm, I'm really happy that, <laughs> as you can tell, like I am, I, I'm over the moon right now that we get to have our Stop fans back Stop in the lying. stadium. Stop I, lying. No, I am. I really am good. I'm, I'm really am glad because now it shows that you know we're moving in the right direction or whatever, whatever. Okay, fans get to be in the stadium. But my guy, if they mess around and come out there and lay an egg, I've been booed. <laughs> when you've had, you know, a stadium full of people. Yes. But it has to feel like a special type of boo when you only get booed with only 5,000 in there. You know, people that risk COVID to come to your game and to let you know, boo. <laughs> stop, stop, oh, stop. I hope you wrong for that. You wrong for that. But I, but am I lying? No, you're not lying. You tell me. Because <laughs> <You know, laughs> I mean, you ain't lying. <laughs> you know, because I mean, you know, because I, you know, I remember playing in the vet when we had people show up with bags on their heads because we were, I mean, we were three and thirteen. Yeah, so, yeah. so you're gonna get booed. But man, when you mess around and you come out there and you lay an egg against yeah. the Ravens, oh yeah. my gosh, man, now that has to be a special type of boo. That's going to be coming when you only had you only allow a certain capacity and a certain number of people, and when they let you know that they 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 risk COVID to come see yeah. you play, you better yeah. play on a certain level. Or boy, it might get ugly enough. When you talk about weapons, I mean this Ravens team is loaded. Anytime your quarterback is a leading rusher, especially a guy who's as fast as just about anybody in your team, that's a nightmare in itself. But I tell you what, man, this wide receiver they have Marquise Brown runs like a four two. And you were talking about teams starting to throw more at Darius Slade now, and if Darius Slade's going to match up on him, I can't wait to see this one, Trey. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it's going to be a, a, a really good game. You know, uh, I think it's going to be an entertaining game. You yes. know, uh, I think it's going to be an entertaining game. A lot of action. You know, yep. a lot of moving around. Ball is going to be everywhere. But um, yeah. a lot of speed on the field. I mean, you know, Lamar Jackson has to be – he's going to probably be the fastest guy on the field, period. I mean, you know – when I watched him against the uh, Chiefs, man, and there was one particular play when he hit up the sideline, and it, it, it seems like you just saw that man hit a gear. And it's like he turned, and, man, when he got up the left side of that field, I'm like, yeah. oh, my gosh. I don't think there is anyone on our on our team that can catch this man if he gets a little room. You know, mm -hmm. so. Can it? Can it? Can it? Can, it, can his Eagles defense stop the Ravens? in you know, a running game. When you have that that dual threat quarterback like that, it opens up a lot of things. And you look this running this running uh, game for Baltimore is three deep. Man, you're talking about Mark Ingram, a guy who doesn't get a lot of recognition. Uh, uh, Gus Brown, and then you got that young man from Ohio State, J.K. Dobbins, and they all average big yards per carry. Can can this defense bow up and, and stop this run game? And let me ask you again: Can this defense bow up? <laughs> And stop this one game? I don't want to answer you. Um, Let me you know ask what? you again. Can this defense blow up and stop this run game? Yeah, man. Yeah. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> I, you know, I, You're like a politician. You can't make a definitive decision, yeah, man. You know, they haven't shown me that they can. They, you know, you, you know, they, they kind of quieted 
you know, uh, Connor down there, out there in Pittsburgh, but you know what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now, it's just, all right, man, I don't know. You know, hopefully Singleton can come out there and give us some. Right, and, and, uh, check, check. Who else? <laughs> Check. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Don't forget, you got Willie Sneed out yeah, there just catching uh, the ball too, man. Yeah, Hello? yeah. Hello? yeah I, I, I don't know because I mean they're going because you're going to have to play nickel. You're going to have to play nickel the most of the uh, most of this defense. I mean, most they of the need game. they need to come up with a quarter quarter scheme dollar something. Nickel ain't yeah. working. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what you know because maybe you rush three. And, and uh, but I, but then I don't know, man. I, I, rush three. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what Pittsburgh did a lot of that against us. They rushed three and two rushes, right. but yeah, but right. and yeah, I I, I, I don't know because I'm trying to look at anybody. I'm okay. trying to find find some names here that could possibly you know step up for us, but yeah, I, I don't, I can't. I, I don't find. I can't see anybody. Because, right. right. yeah. Let, let, go ahead. Go ahead. No, nah, that's uh, no. That, no. <laughs> All right, let's go to the Ravens' defense now. Look yeah. at the quarterback situation. They have um, Mar what Marlon Humphrey. You have Jimmy Smith. You you have Marcus Peters. You look at the linebackers. You got you got that a bad young man. I thought the Eagles were going to draft Patrick Queen. You got Pernell McPhee. Uh. Uh, they, oh, by the way, Baltimore's defense has 16 quarterback sacks uh, coming in this game. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I got nothing. You know, what? What do you mean? I, you got, I, I got, I got nothing. I'm just hoping. What do you mean you got nothing? Right. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Can, can we pull it off? I, I don't know. You know, I, I always felt like you know if Carson could make it out of this Pittsburgh game. Which he did. He took some lumps, you know, yeah. five sacks, eleven quarterback hits. That you know yeah. what we might yeah. be trending in the right direction. But now I knew going into this that Baltimore was going to be that <laughs> next, <laughs> that next big challenge. And sure enough, here they are. I mean, you know, sixteen sacks, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, all right. So the moment, the moment of truth. Who are you picking in this game? Oh, I put my money on Baltimore. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, I mean. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think the line right now is seven and a half. So, yeah, um, yeah depending on, you know, I don't know if Lane is going to be playing in this game. Right. Um, you know, so that means that you're going to have some more inconsistency at tackle and just chemistry. Um, Matt Pryor has not been playing well these past couple games. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah and, I did a, and I did a really nice breakdown on Matt Pryor right now. He's making me look like a fool. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> you know, right now he's struggling with Matt Pryor. So, uh, you know, I hope that Joe oh. Mailata just continues to progress. That's oh, did I mention? Did I mention? Did I mention that that man uh, Calais Campbell is on the field also? That six-seven man Calais Campbell on the field. You all know, we already know what he is. We know what he is. That man's salivating right now. Yeah, yeah. So. So you put your money on Baltimore? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I put my money on Baltimore on this one. I'm sorry. Yeah, I am. I am. Well, but, but two, let, let me look at it like this: two weeks in a row, Eagles defense looking better, getting better and better. Right? They have this game at home. They're gonna have a few more fans in the stand. They're gonna have about five, six thousand fans in the stand. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I feel. I feel. I feel momentum is starting to shift. But I ain't that stupid. I'm picking, no, I'm picking Baltimore. I'm picking Baltimore. Yeah, if I'm a bad man. I'm putting all my monopoly money on Baltimore this game. No yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Like I feel like they they are trending kind of in the right direction ish. Right, yeah. right, right. But yeah. right. you know, I, I, to sit up there and say, you know what, I to put my money on the birds and feel like they're gonna walk in there and just destroy a team. Mm. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, maybe maybe against New York? Question mark. Yeah, I know they can't wait to get to that game. You know? yeah. But hey, look, I, look, I, I may be dumb every now and then, but I ain't stupid. So, nah. yeah. so I'm, I'm picking the Ravens for this game. No Absolutely. question about it. Yeah, that's uh, where I am as well. All right, that is going to wrap up another fun-filled edition of Grilling the Birds, uh, brought to you by Inside the Birds. For my man right there, the insider, 
the expert, the analyst, my colleague, and more importantly, my friend, Trey Thomas. I'm Derek Gunn. Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you next week. Keep your fingers crossed, everybody. I right just hope there. it's a good game. I you can't know even what? cross my fingers. Yeah. Miracle, miracles do happen. We could see an upset. We could. I'm not counting on it, but we could see an upset. I'm not putting my money on it, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so long, everybody. Have a great day.